Welcome everyone. This masterclass is titled Urban Village Regeneration, Guiding Cities Towards Sustainable Growth. Well, what we do here is we take an example of a small project and see what we can learn from that exercise towards this greater objective of guiding cities towards sustainable growth. Well, in India, like in many other developing countries where populations continue to grow, existing cities are regenerating, utilizing land more intensively, and also expanding geographically. And in this chart, you can see, it's an interesting thing to note, that the large cities had grown very, very rapidly over the last couple of decades, but now that rate of growth is slowing down and the smaller towns are picking up. What you can see here graphically is that whether you're in a coastal city like Mumbai or Chennai or in an inland city like Delhi or Hyderabad, over the years, populations have been growing. And as you can see, both things are happening. The graphic is very clear. That there is a densification in the heart of the city and there's also a geographic expansion. In this process, villages that are located close to the city get drawn into the city economy. And typically, right across the Indian subcontinent, there are villages, like every 10 or 15 kilometers, you'll find a village. Existing villages regenerate in response to the demand for affordable shelter, because it so happens that land is a bit cheaper and the facilities are not that great, so it's cheaper to live there, it's more affordable. Old buildings are replaced by new four-story tall buildings. Open spaces get occupied or squeezed, the urban fabric becomes dense with narrow streets and lanes. That's a process that takes on. But what is really interesting is that the grain of development is small, not big projects, but small projects. And it will always have some mixed use, as was the case in traditional villages and towns. So what we are looking at here is a village called Jonapur on the outskirts of the city of New Delhi. You can see how the old village is, you know, it's, it's very organic, the way it has grown. And towards the edge, it has become a bit more regular, as you can see around you. Uh, but it is a fairly dense settlement. And we look at a small project in an urban village on the outskirts, Jonapur. It's a mixed-use building. And what we explore there is principles of design and construction that guide transformation of the urban village toward a sustainable future. The project is called Butterflies, which is for a non-profit organization that works for street-related children. So what you have is a very deep and narrow plot of land, which is accessed by a fairly narrow lane a village lane. There's vehicular access up to the plot. And in the depth of the plot, it's like three separate units which are connected by an inner lane inside the plot. And the courts uh, bring light and ventilation. Basement and three stories are what are built. And the roof is now like a new ground. As you can see, in this aerial photograph, the plot is almost completely covered with small pockets as courtyards that bring light and ventilation into the building. Well, the mixed use combines residence, work and recreation. A section on the left hand side shows you and the image on the right hand side shows you how there's a narrow lane that actually passes under the building with pockets of light coming down to light up the narrow lane and ventilate it, uh, which gives you access to the depth of the plot. So it becomes a way of uh, intensifying the development 
under the pressure of demand on this plot of land, but still making it work without necessarily requiring vehicular access into the depth of the plot, but still utilizing the land quite intensively. So you have a basement, you have the ground, first, second floors, three floors on top. Here you can see the division of functions. On the right-hand side, um, we have where the children stay, three stories, two stories, with some recreation provision for them. In the middle, in the basement, and on the first floor, are offices. Above that is a training kitchen attached to a multipurpose room which can act as a cafe. On the left-hand side, where the bicycles can be seen, is, in a, is a parking area with access to the main access road. And upstairs in the front is some residential space for guests. And then there is some, there's a doctor's room, there's a small dining room, and so on, connected again to the children's side. And you go to the roof, um, well, the roof does its own thing because it's the new ground. So it's a very complex building with lots of functions integrated into a single building, but essentially it is three blocks with interspersed courtyards in between, an open space at the back, and open space in the front. Now, that structure of space, open space and built up space with the courtyards and the lane, actually provides the engine for making the environmental systems work. This is a chart that shows the climatic pattern in Delhi. You can see that when it is a dry summer, very high temperature, dry summer, evaporative cooling can work very well. When it becomes quite humid, evaporative cooling doesn't work so well, but you need some aided ventilation. So the section shows that you have evaporative coolers installed at the edges of the building and that there are suction fans that draw the air from the evaporative coolers through the spaces and throws it throw, throw, throw the air outwards, thereby keeping the spaces cool, especially during the hot season, hot dry season. In the humid season, the ventilation system continues to work. If the natural ventilation, because the breeze has died down, is not strong enough, some additional exhaust fans can be added. So you have a combination of ceiling fans, exhaust fans, and evaporative cooling systems that actually provide the basic comfort parameters for this building. How do you get light down to the basement through these tiny little courtyards? Well, the surprising thing is the skies are very bright. And so daylight, during the bright sky, if you've got your courtyards painted white as reflective courtyards, you'll find it's amazing how much daylight can reach right down to the bottom. So in the middle spaces, the daylight is provided by the, the narrow but bright courtyards. And at the end spaces, of course, you have more opening to the front and the back. On the rooftop, uh, you can see the solar chart drawn in a circle at the top, south is to the right, north to the, south, south is to the left, and north is to the right. Winter sun dips on the southern side. Winter is fairly chilly, and it is nice to have some winter sunshine in the chilly period. So the two floors above will get the benefit of the winter sun, and that area which is facing the winter sun on the left-hand side will also get some benefit of it. The rest of it won't, but this is what we can manage of the winter sun being caught there. In addition, sunshine is caught by other devices that are placed on the rooftop. Here's a picture of the courtyard, bright and white. Here's a picture of that narrow lane. See how well it is lit because the brightness of the sky does all the, all, all the work for lighting up the lane also. Well, very interesting. You have the training kitchen. The waste from the kitchen goes to the rooftop. At the rooftop, there are composting bins. And from the composting bins, 
you also have a little bit of urban farming, which is in the backyard and on the rooftop. It is already beginning to take off. This is only just about, this is the first year where this season of planting and harvesting is occurring and the kitchen has been in operation. So here you have an interesting cycle, a local cycle of organic waste being composted and being fed into organic growth of vegetables and herbs, which go back to the kitchen once again. Well, the rooftop, as we say, is the new ground. And now the new ground meets the sky. What can you do with the sky? You can install the solar water heaters on the sky, in this, uh, at the, on the rooftop. Once one array is meant for the toilets that serve the dormitories of the, for the children. There are three sets of solar PV arrays that take care of all the basic lighting fans and exhaust fans and the computers in the offices. They provide all the energy required for that. And then you have another solar, solar hot water array for the kitchen and the guest rooms. So the new ground, which collects energy from the sun, is able to convert it into electricity and into hot water that can be then used for the building. It's interesting that for three to four stories, if you have sufficient solar PV integrated into the roof or built on the roof, you can actually meet the basic energy needs of the people and the functions below. Similar principle now applies to water, trying to manage everything within your tiny little site. So the rainwater that comes in, in the front yard, in the backyard, and in the courtyards, goes down to a groundwater recharge. And fresh water is brought in from the municipal supply. This supply is then used for the kitchens and for the toilets. The gray water is then treated again. The, the, the dark water um, is, is sent out to the municipality, but the gray water is treated and recycled into the flush. This all together makes for significant water savings in the project and it really shows that even to small scale collecting, harvesting, recycling is doable and beneficial. Materials. Well, here's an idea. The city is regenerating and so as old buildings go down, some material can be recovered from the old buildings. So in this particular project, you can, uh, we use rubble aggregate for non-structural concrete made from the bricks that, was, that came out of the original building that was here. We use the original bricks again in the new walls. The basement, which is excavated, produces the earth from which we can make cement stabilized earth blocks, which are used then in the walls. Local sandstone is used for the covers over the windows and recycled timber is used doors and indoors and windows. So it's really like working a circular economy at a local scale. This is how the, this was quite a learning experience. Everybody had to learn. None of us had done this before. I hadn't got it done before. The workers hadn't got it done before, but we got some trainers to come and train us on how to produce the soil stabilized, uh, cement stabilized soil blocks. And we learned how to do them. The simple machine didn't have enough productivity. We had to go for a mechanized system. And eventually it is built into the building. And in many places, we show the bricks as, as something to recognize in the aesthetic of the building itself. Another uh, trial run, this is something that none of us had done before. This is Bubble Deck, which is now an industrial product or a service that is available in Europe and Australia and many other parts of the world. It's a structural system in which the, the, the balls, the plastic balls, which in this case are recycled plastic balls, are used to remove the unnecessary concrete. And so we learned how to do it ourselves and we have put this in as a way of recycling uh, used plastic in the form of balls reducing the amount of cement and concrete used in the structure, reducing the weight of the slabs, and thereby reducing 
structural steel requirement, reducing embodied energy. So earth blocks reduce embodied energy significantly. And in this, the structural system also reduces its embodied energy. And here are the recycled doors and windows. We took a vow not to use aluminum because that is very high on embodied energy. And we were very lucky. Some of the doors and windows were really, very beautiful from old buildings. Look at that one on the right hand side. And the kids are really happy with the, with the colorful painted over a motley group of doors and windows that have been assembled in the building. Well, I think it is extremely important that in even, even in a simple project like this, which integrates many sustainability principles, you must have a way of experiencing the beauty of what you do. So here is an external adjustable shading system outside the main room, uh, which is an artwork. You can open it partially, you can open it fully, you can turn it all around. And this artwork actually tells a wonderful story that the children like to talk about. And none of this can happen if you don't have the right patronage and belief in the potential of sustainable work, even when it is experimental, even when it is the first time you're doing it. It is a process through which you learn, and by repeating such processes, you actually develop the culture of sustainable building. If you follow all the principles that we have here, incorporated in this building, right from urban planning principles of how to make intensification of land use in urban, in, in urban villages, what morphology to use to get a system of light and ventilation into dense developments, how to create a new ground and interact with the sky for benefit, and how to actually make all the systems, including construction methods and materials, respond to the demand of sustainable construction. So here again, out of scrap metal, we have a donor's tree, tree. And much of it was supported by Miserio. Thank you.